This is stream number 14 and uh, I know this is much quieter today. Um, last stream we had Van Halen and you know all this kind of heavy energy and high gain tones. Uh, <clears throat> today I want to talk about more um, subtle things. I want to talk about clean tones, different clean tones and also how you can customize your amp one. Um, you know there's uh, the four channels, there's the EQ, there's all the dials and um, there are options that you might have not explored so far. And it all depends on what you like. I mean, I like what the M1 is offering like straight out of the box because this is the way I designed it. Um, but I wanted to show you that there are even more options. We've created this little uh, booklet here, which comes with our new test station. And it has a little instruction how you can do a boutique tuning for your Amp1. Well, um, let me explain what's going on here. Each of the four channels has its own gain structure. And the gain can be dialed in with the gain control for the overdrive channels and with the volume for the clean channel. And each of those controls are, well, kind of uh, analog potentiometers. You, you get what you see, a knob, a potentiometer that dials in the tone. And there is a treble bleed on the potentiometer, which means the more I reduce the gain or the volume, the, the more high end you will get. So you can get like brighter sounds, more like hi-fi tones, if you reduce the gain or the volume on the clean channel. Sometimes that's just perfect. I designed it that way because I'm coming from the Stratocaster and with the Strat, I like to be able to have a lot of gain so I get a full tone from the circuit. Loading the circuit with a lot of gain makes the sound rich and full. Like. And when I reduce the volume here, it's getting thinner, which is great if you're using a humbucker guitar. So there's a reason why I've done that. But still, you might want a different tone. And now comes the lesson, what I can do with the Amp1. Just for example, let's start with a clean channel. Um, so you understand what I'm doing here is, let's go back. I have the remote one connected to the Amp1 with a standard guitar cable. So this is foot switch socket into the remote one. And, um, I'm starting with the clean channel. Oh, wait. I'm. So this is clean. I dial in 10. It's a nice, big, round, fat, clean tone, okay? Maybe a bit too hot and a bit too fat. Of course, on 10, on the clean volume, it already starts to break up, okay? I wanted the clean channel to be that way because the good old Fender amps, they have the same uh, behavior. I mean, if you crank a Fender amp, they start to break up and there's the beauty. But now 
where is the sweet spot? Where is the spot where the amp is just on the edge and where you get this kind of snappy feeling? This is what I'm looking for right now. I just reduce the, the volume a, a tiny little bit. And you can hear how it, well, it gets thinner and spankier. Full, oh, 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 rich. E, 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 e. And the, the more I reduce, the more I reduce the clean volume, the thinner it gets. I compensate by giving it more master volume. So you hear, this is, it's almost harsh. So what I want is a nice blend between the two. So where's the sweet spot? Okay, this is how the clean channel itself sounds. Hmm, I do have some options here. I have a built-in boost and I like the boost because it makes the sound very rich. But it's just way too hot, way too overloaded. So let's reduce the clean volume. Okay, that's kind of nice. But it's getting too thin, too harsh. Hmm. And now we are at the point where I want to customize the clean channel. So we have a function which is called low gain mode and in the low gain mode you can learn the M1 Mercury Edition and Iridium Edition an individual gain setting for each channel. So how to access the gain for this channel. Clean. So this is, okay, this is just a clean channel and I have the reverb on. And now I want to access the second gain. I use the boost function from the remote, press and hold it until it blinks. And now this control here is my second gain. And now I can dial in a another gain here. Wow. If I can do this, I can increase the volume here again. And I reduce it. A but I've got now to me, what I hear here with my studio monitor is like the perfect balance between the perfect high end, the perfect mid range and low end. And I could find it by reducing the gain for the clean channel and having a certain setting on the volume here. I know this sounds very complicated, but this is kind of sound design, okay? This is next level. Uh, usually you, t you tweak the knobs and this is what you get. But what I'm saying here is you can go deeper. This is the highest level on the amp one. So what, what we are doing here is like, by reducing the clean volume here, I get a little sparkle from the treble bleed capacitor from the clean volume. And I get just the right amount um, from the gain reduction in the clean channel. So just double checking here, full, too hot, a little less, on the edge of breakup. And this is like, just perfect to me. Maybe a little bit more. Using the boost. So, huh. What I've got here right now is a different gain structure in the clean channel and using the boost. So if you can do this with the internal boost, you could also have external boosters. So here are some examples what I can do with external stuff. This is my good old trusty Dynacomp compressor.
Okay, compressor, more sustain and a richer tone. Off. Pretty dry. And with, okay, the Dynacom. That's pretty nice. Okay. Mm, how would it sound with a different boost? I can uh, switch off the internal boost and just have the compressor. Yeah, something is missing. Of course, I can get more volume. But now you hear the internal boost was kind of making the tone rich, you know, by overtones, by creating something. A clean compressor is not doing the same with this amp here. Okay, let me try the steel string. Boost. I bring in the built-in boost again. And therefore I use less of the steel string. So it's kind of cascading two boosts. And the compressor. That's a pretty thick clean tone. Um, okay, just for fun, I tried a super hard on, which is another style of boost. That's good for clarity. I like it.
Aha, hmm, that's kind of a rich clean tool. And for fun, have the street string too. <laughs> vintage tone. Anyway, there's some options. Okay, this is the lesson about how you can get to different clean tones with the low gain mode, with dialing in a different gain for the clean channel. Okay, um, you can do this either with a remote one you can do this with any MIDI controller, like this little AMT, uh, a small programmable MIDI controller that offers to access any MIDI parameter. And this is um, easy. Um, okay, you have to set it up once, which is, a, is, is kind of, a, a, it takes some work, but once, you, you dialed in the parameter um, gain, you can simply send the value and memorize it to each of the channels. So each of the channels can have its individual gain. So for the clean channel, I was now on kind of half gain. Okay, um, let's have a look on the other channels. So, or maybe I simply go back to normal. So you, get, so we, we're digging in deep and now I'm getting back to the surface. Back to standard. So that's the M1 as it is. And that's the internal boost. Which sounds very good. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I wanted to show you that several options that you might haven't heard about or that, uh, yeah, you, sh you should know about that. There are options in case, especially if it's too hot or if it's too bright for you. Simply reduce the gain for the channel that is too bright for you. I show you, go half. Huh? And the other way. So this is standard, which is maximum gain, internal gain, and reduced gain on the clean volume. Or the other way, maximum gain here and reduced gain here is... This is like way warmer than the other way around, okay? Gotcha? Okay, um, let's have a look what we can do with the overdrive channels. Okay, switch to whatever vintage, I can do it here. Um, I'm in the, yeah, I'm in the vintage channel and now I want to dial in the gain. So this is gain on full. Um, and this is gain on full here. So this is as it chips. Now if I reduce the gain on the gain for the vintage overdrive gain here, it's getting super sparkly, which is great. It's Vox AC30 Topu st style. Okay, just for fun, I do it the other way around. I bring the gain up on the overdrive gain and reduce here. Thank you. 
So this is now gainful on the control and you know, what is it, 11 o'clock on the second gain here. I reduce this even further down to zero, like zero gain or as low as you can get. And we have a, a nice kind of clean sound. On the edge of breakup. Okay, this is the character of the vintage channel. And the funny thing is, I can do this with every overdrive channel. Let us compare the vintage channel on zero gain to the classic channel. The classic channel is already kind of on the edge of breaking up. Back to the vintage. And the classic. This has, you know, more boards. to the vintage. This is vintage on full and low gain here. Now I bring in the boost. Killer, killer <laughs> blues overdrive tone. Okay, just for you to memorize, this was zero gain here, internal boost on max, and the gain of the overdrive on max. So that's a setting that you can use with a lot of other channels as well. And you could program this into your vintage channel to make this your personal kind of customized vintage channel that has that kind of amount of gain. If you're using the remote, you could make a preset, one with that setting and the next one which is totally normal, which would be simply vintage, full gain here and no boost. Let us compare. This is that tone 
switch off the boot and have all the, the gain from here. This to me is more rock, you know, it's like... Ah, today I'm on my different cabinet. Let me dial in my Marshall cabinet for rock. So... So you hear, okay, this is rock as it comes. Now back to what we, where we went before, no gain here, full gain here, but boost on. Yeah, and then get me the nice 2x12 black, which is a Fender Twin Reverb cabinet. And yeah, here we go, and we are in blues territory. So you get a picture, we can tweak each channel and I could use this as a platform for pedals again, like I showed you with the boost um, from whatever, the super hard one. Let's try this. I have this, switch this off and get the super hard on and use that boost, okay? <laughs> Another one that's fun, okay? Um, but of course, I can use less gain. From Compare 
compared to the internal. Yeah, in this kind of gain range we are pretty similar with the two boosters, but uh, yeah, this one has more output and it saturates the clean, uh, uh, sorry, the vintage preamp in a special way. Hmm, nice, sweet, okay. Or we could try something in between, you know, just maxing out tones, just to show you. So we have the boost here. I go to middle position, reduce the gain here. But this could be fantastic for another guitar. Let me try a P90 guitar. Where's my good old trusty 1956 Les Paul Jr. So. You can see there is a sweet spot for every guitar possible with the amp one on each channel. So just for fun, let's go and find the one for this guitar on the classic channel. Oh, maybe in tune. So this is full gain as it chips. That's kind of half gain. Yeah, that's a nice setting for this guitar. This is about what is tone, what is tone for me, what is tone for you. For me it's kind of the sweet spot of all the frequencies meet the breakup point. <laughs> so, you know, when the frequencies are not too harsh but still sparkling, thick enough, beefy enough and the overdrive is just, you know, at the dynamic point and therefore I like different channels and I like different tones where the compression is kind of ideal where 
yeah, where it's rough enough so I can, you know, play dynamic. This is my kind of game. Maybe you, you're not into this kind of dynamic playing and you want more compressed lead tone like Ellen Holdsworth. There's nothing wrong about that. It's just a different style. Then you need a different setting. I show you some overdrive pedals uh, for that. Ah, and just for fun, let's hear how the modern does sound when we have low gain from the remote. <laughs> This is full gain as it chips. But maybe you want less. Guitar talks. Back to classic. Yeah, it's more dry. And back to vintage. just excited about all the options and now whatever back to another guitar or the strat and some more options with pedals okay this is the same sound with this guitar this is kind of too bright you know uh, or maybe you like it spanky <laughs> Magic combination, I love it. Okay, um, I'm setting up a few drive pedal, real drive pedals, which are here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, I'm getting rid of the compressor. Oh, sorry. Let me plug this in here. It's 
So this goes into here, this goes into there. Done. Uh, but we need power. Power, power, power. I hope this will work as this is a bit funky here. Um, they all need power. This one needs power. This one needs power. Where is it? Ah, on the top. And this one, another one that needs power. I hope it's the Big Joe power supply uh, can deliver enough. Okay, anyway, switch off the boost. And uh, we have no single. Oh, okay. Where are we now? We have uh, no guitar. Where's the guitar? Ah, on the floor. <laughs> okay, on the floor is the guitar. Guitar. Guitar to this pedal. Okay. Works. 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 So at this point, everything is off. So this is the beautiful vintage channel on zero gain. I tried a fat boost. Yeah, makes it fat, but not pleasant. I tried a Friedman, which is a high gain overdrive pedal. For a different cabinet, my favorite stack 1970, which is the one that everybody uses, uh, or that I use and everybody likes. <laughs> yeah, okay, high gain territory needs a Marshall stack, so this is the proof, okay. <laughs> Let's try the Tube King. Okay, this is kind of a mid-gain overdrive. I, I'd like the, uh, the Friedman, by the way. Okay, it's always a nice pedal. Now the Tube King. Super sweet. So that's another option. Zero gain here, drive from this pedal. There's a lot of compression and there's a lot of sweetness coming from the Tube King. Mm. 
compare it to the Friedman. And maybe compare it to a Gainier sound from the M1, which might be first the vintage with the boost on. Ah, then we need the gain back, sorry guys. That's okay. Somebody is noisy here in the single chain. Anyway, um, so this is that's the vintage channel, and now I switch to wait a minute. One of the pedals is not having a good bypass. See, this is how clean it is when, and therefore you need this little toy here. Come on, this is what we call our looper kit. And the looper kit is a pedal switching system that works together with a remote one. And then you can program which of the pedals will be active in your signal path. Uh, you know, so you have this super pure clean tone from the amp one and the next preset is maybe one of the pedals and you get rid of all this hiss and hum and bullshit. So looper kit, very important, or any pedal switcher, if you do crazy stuff with pedal like me now. So now back to the... <laughs> That's the sound from the M1 itself in the classic channel as it gets, as it comes. Now let's compare it again with all the pedals. It was lovely. It was, a, you know, just a bit sweeter, I, I thought. Okay, no, sorry, I have to go back for the vintage. No. Yeah, it's a beautiful sound. There's nothing wrong about pedals. The only thing you should know is, I believe the amp itself has more dynamics, more like the real amps, or actually the dynamics of a real amp, because that's what I'm so proud of, that our preamps are just like the real DU tube preamps. The pedals on the market, they are dynamic, but they have a bit more compression. They are a bit nicer. And the way, the way they, they sound is sometimes sweeter. If you want that, that's great. I mean, I'm not saying this is better. It's just different. And whatever difference makes more sense for you, it's your choice and it is better for you. You decide if you like that better or that combination. I'm just showing you all the options here, okay? I think you get the message. Um, okay, this was a lot of preaching about the gain structure that can be achieved in each channel. And please mind, you can store a, an individual gain structure for each channel on the M1 Mercury edition and Iridium edition. The instructions you will find on our website and, when you, and you can download um, this manual or you go to the Mercury Edition expert features on our website. You will find this. And it's done very simply. You dial it in either with a remote one or with a MIDI device. Then you press and hold the boost button. And then you uh, press reverb. And this will kind of store your new gain setting, which I dialed in here, to your channel. You select another channel, you dial in another max gain from, from here or from your MIDI device into that channel. So you can actually customize your own amp one in every channel what, when it comes to gain. The other thing is what we've got is we have a, 
an option for the half power mode, which is great um, when you don't want the full headroom of 100 watts. But um, I believe it's uh, nah, not really necessary unless you don't want to kill the speaker or you're afraid of being too loud and want that kind of 50 watt feel of an amp. I prefer the 100 watt even though sometimes I dial it back to master volume and that's, that, that's my kind of thing. Anyway, another question, I know I repeat myself a bit, but we always had a question about how can I get a second master volume? Well, one option is on the remote one, there is a second master volume that you can dial in. So you have a level for your rhythm sound and then you have a, a level for your lead tones. And if you do preset, Every preset can has, have its own level of volume, besides own level of gain, what I just showed you. And of course, you could control all the pedals with the expansion, with the um, looper kit expansion for the remote. So you can actually go crazy. But the other option is you can be very simple with a minus booster. This is just a passive volume control that you can bring in the effects loop and the effects loop then can reduce the volume with this control. So you have a rhythm volume and a lead volume on the foot switch here. So there are a couple of pedals like that out there and that's a very easy way to get two volume levels for the same sound for rhythm and solo. The third option would be you have something like this little fellow here, <laughs> the MIDI baby by Disaster Area Designs, nice name. And this little foot switch here is MIDI. And the MIDI foot switch can be programmed. And this can be, you can dial in your personal level of master volume here. And then this goes into our MIDI one adapter. That's our MIDI one adapter. And the MIDI one adapter goes into the foot switch and then this pedal will tell the amp1 how loud the second master volume should be. Or you can have this as a power soak. So there's, there's several ways how to get um, these extra functionalities uh, controlled with external devices. So this is the very, very small one. And here I have another one which is from AMT. This is like a double foot switch one that you can have and set for, for a parameter and increase and decrease the volume or you can program anything to these switches. Uh, I know it's some kind of work, but once it's done, it's simply stable working. So there are options. Um, and all this is great to match it to your personal taste, to your guitar. You know, in the old days, we had people that, that had their Marshalls, for example, modified. On the back of this Marshall, you can see a lot of parameters, um, and these are simply values that are usually fixed in the amp, and they are now here modified so they can be adjusted, like the, the current feedback, the Gegenkopplung here, and there is a presence control, a special one. You know, here I can switch uh, certain caps, um, values to match the frequencies in certain stages to match the guitars. But this is actually what we've just heard on the M1. It's a similar thing, just done in a different way. So we kind of thought of this kind of tweaking option um, and not everybody makes the modifications on its Marshall and not everybody is doing those modifications on your amp one but in case you want to go there there's the option so we thought of that too okay um, maybe we have a few questions here um, I'd like to answer um, Peter Müller, sounds very German. Thomas, can I use the vintage channel on five without the gain reduction on the remote one and have the classic channel on gain seven? Um, 
to 8. Can I use the vintage channel on 5 without... Okay, um, no. So when you set this gain control to a certain position, it is analog, it will stay there. What you can do um, is you can dial in different gain levels for the channels, which means you set the gain here on a certain um, sound, match it with the second gain here, and then you will dial in another value for your classic channel, but you can't change that knob. And then match with this parameter here. That's the idea about um, customizing gain. Yeah, and the way it's done is you dial it in here, you press and hold the boost button, and then while holding it, you press reverb and it will memorize it to the position of the switch. Okay? That's the way how to customize your M1. So the next one is um, Neptonic 101. Do you use the Marshalls or the M1 when playing by yourself? Hey, when I'm playing by myself, I use the M1 all the time. <laughs> um, I used to play Marshalls, that's why I have the full collection, but uh, somehow those days are over. I'm, I'm a big Marshall fan, yes, but uh, if you look at all the episodes, you can see that I'm not missing a thing when I play my MP1. It is like almost identical to what I want and what I need. And uh, I'm not missing anything when I play my MP1. This is, it, it's on my pedal board and I've been playing the MP1 for the last oh, six years now, exclusively which means sometimes I do an exception just for checking out an amp, but it's like 99% of all gigs, everything I do lately is done on the amp one. Okay, next question by Paul. Can you talk about the pickup height for tonal differences? Yeah, and I wanted to talk about guitar stuff a bit more. How to set up a Stratocaster. Um, well, I talk about the pickup height. Um, when you put the pickups closer to the strings, uh, let me show you uh, why I'm not hearing anything. I need to plug in, let me keep it simple. Plug this off, switch this on, and then we have no sound. Why? Somebody killed something here. There's no level, yeah, why? The amp seems to work, but... Huh? Ah. Okay, this was zero gain. <laughs> this was... Anyway, so... So this is the bridge pickup in a kind of high position. Let me reduce the height and we listen to the so sound difference. This is less. And back to the high position. Okay, make it high again and you can hear there's more bass, it's way warmer. So the closer the pickup to the string, the bigger and warmer the tone. Show you, even closer. Okay, I don't wanna. This now is the bridge pickup. Okay, similar thing on the neck pickup. Reduce the height, less output, thinner tone, and then Increase. Okay, I'm not going too extreme, but maybe maybe we here. Bigger and warmer. So what I do is, of course, the bridge pickup is always kind of very thin. So I try to get that high. And my idea is the thin strings need 
the closest of the pickup. The bigger strings have a little bit more room between um, the string and the magnet of the pickup. On the other hand, it's like the, the, the neck pickup shouldn't be too close to the strings. And um, I always have the higher strings, I have the, the pickup closer to the strings for the higher strings and lower on the big strings. So that's my kind of theory and it seems to work. That's the thing about um, the guitars. I wanted to show you another thing about guitars in this episode, how to make a Strat stay in tune. Um, you know, the other day I put together this, well, Hendrix blue guitar, which is kind of a leftover Frankenstein uh, blue guitar. And whoops, it's still tuned from the Eddie Van Halen episode. So the f this thing stays in tune. Weird, even on uh, half a note lower. I found a mistake that many people do, and I show you what it is. If you make these screws too tight, the ones on the, or let's put it that way, make it too loose. I open those and make them too loose. Um, Okay, and now watch the tuning stability. Yeah, it's still kind of okay, but it's getting more out of tune. So, how to set up the, the tremolo the right way, I found a, a trick. Um, I usually have no strings connected and no springs in the back. And what I'm doing then is I move the tremolo arm all the way down and then when it's all the way down, I tighten the top or the outer screws to the point where I can see that the screws is touching the top plate of the vibrato system. And that's the point where they actually should be. And then what happens is if you use the, the vibrato system, the plate cannot move on the neck of the screw. Otherwise, the tremolo kind of moves up and down the neck of the screws if, if it's not tight enough. If it's too tight, you can't get the whole excursion of the whammy bar. So it's finding the sweet spot, which means the top of the screw has to touch the plate when the tremolo system is all down. So that's the magic point for this. And the same I do for the other outer screw. The middle, middle screws here, I have them all higher. So the whole guidance comes from the outer screws and the, the, the screws in the middle, there's only, there's only there to have some more guidance, but not in the height. The height is only done by the outer screws. The middle screws are higher, so they only do. And I found out on my original 61 Strat, that this third screw was causing a problem because it was kind of slightly angled. So I took this screw off and now that became my trademark. I have to do this on all my guitars, otherwise people yell at me, it's like not a Thomas Blue style guitar. So you will find me, more, basically every guitar that I usually play has this missing screw here. And as you can see, it works with five screws, it works with six screws, and it works even with less, fewer screws. Some people even use two only, but I am, uh, I, I probably would go up for four minimum. That's my idea. So the next thing 
is I try to reduce any kind of friction in the nut. So you make sure that the string can slide through the nut in a very nice smooth way. And therefore you use sandpaper and depending on the, th the, the gauge of your string you have to make sure that the nut is cut the right way and maybe use the sandpaper so every, every edge is kind of smooth. And when you're, when you're finished then you use something like a lubricant. This kind of material here is used uh, for weapons. They use it for whatever, pistols or whatever. Um, and this makes it slide easily. So you have a, a little drop inside there, which is super cool. And um, once the string has cut the nut too deep, and then it starts to rattle on the first fret, what you can do is you get off the string and then um, you clean the nut and then you can have some super glue and when you have a bone nut you simply rub it with sandpaper a little bit and the, the kind of bone dust gets inside the nut and that's a super strong um, yeah, material because the, the, the super glue and the, the, the dust from the bone makes, makes the hole, fills the hole again and then the string will be higher. If it's too high, you have to use the sandpaper again. So this needs to be optimized, that the angle is not too tight, that there is no way of getting uh, the string stuck in a way. So this needs to be, you know, uh, slippery as can be. The next thing I've done here is I put my string tree higher. Can we show this here? Yeah. So the string tree here, is actually, oops, I loosened the string, uh, the, 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 the tree by having the screw loose so this thing can move. And I found that helps because the angle of the string is not too heavy and uh, it needs to be tight so the string is safely inside the, the, the cuts here but not too too, too much down because every time you bend the string it will kind of cut itself a deeper hole and then it will get stuck one day all bullshit so make sure that the angle here is not too much okay that helps the next thing is if you have machine heads don't use too many windings because if you have tons of windings on the machine heads it will simply not stay in tune of course, a lot of stretching is needed and if you break a string, well, better break it before the guitar is uh, out of tune for ages. So that's the, the, the way of setting up uh, a Stratocaster. And this is the other thing. I'm using three springs and I have the first one for the lower, uh, the thick strings angled. So there is more pressure from, the, from, the, from that side where the lower strings are and there's a little bit less pressure on the side uh, for the top strings. And as I'm using a free floating, um, come on, I use my standard uh, tuning guitar. I have the I have this G string bending up a minor third. The B string is bending up a, a whole tone. No. And then the E string, the high E string, is only bending up a half note. And the good thing about that is you can play some intervals um, between the G string and the B string.
I'm not the only one that discovered this, <laughs> but I met somebody who is a killer guitar player from Los Angeles. And when we, when we met, he told me he's doing exactly the same. And this is Mr. Carl Fahane. And we had a, a great time. I think we met last year uh, in LA in his home. Uh, he invited me to come to his place. Very friendly guy, a killer player, you know. He checked me out big time. He put on some backing tracks and he made me suffer. <laughs> Playing fast country licks and, you know, blues and rock and wild shit and harmonic stuff. But we had fun. A very nice fellow. We actually met before in Germany where we were teaching. I was teaching uh, near Stuttgart having my class, master class, and he's having his, and we were kind of room neighbors for a week or so. Um, yeah, this was, uh, was cool. So that's the way how he sets it up and how I set it up. So there's nothing wrong about that. And this is free floating, which means you can go up and down. And uh, it's musical and it's proven to work pretty well. And uh, it does stay in tune if you do everything right. I mean, sometimes I do have trouble too when the strings are totally fresh uh, and new and not stretched well. And sometimes something is wrong with the setup here. Uh, uh, but if everything is in order, you can play with the guitar and the rest, of course, it's all in your fingers. You can still bend with your hands, you know. Jeff Beck can play a guitar even without being in tune because he's got ears and he bends it with a, with a, you know, it's like, no worries, you can play. It's all in the fingers, in the end, okay. Um, I do have another question here. Max, um, hi, M1 switches with any MIDI controller. I saw the photo at Instagram where it was run by Nux, uh, so, yeah, sure. Um, the Amp1 has a MIDI option and the MIDI option is realized with the MIDI1 adapter, which is this little fellow here. That's the MIDI1 adapter. You need the MIDI1 adapter to make this socket a MIDI input. So I do have somewhere, I do have, yes, I do have here in my pocket. <laughs> In my pocket I have a MIDI 1 adapter which is broken, so I show you the inside of a MIDI 1 adapter. I hope we can see that. Um, and as you can see, there is a little PCB inside. So some people complain about why is the adapter so expensive? Well, it's not expensive because this is solid metal. You can put your feet on that, you can jump on it and it won't break because this is the most solid um, five pole um, socket plug that I could find. And we have the PCB with the optocoupler and some other parts inside. And on the other side, we have a single uh, and very simple, where is it? Um, where's the middle one? Here it is. Um, it's a simple quarter inch jack and uh, our new cables come with this kind of flat cable and the angled um, quarter inch jack. In the old days we had big standard straight um, quarter inch plugs and uh, in case you don't like those big ones you can simply swap for a angled one. So. Um, this side is easy, you know, just cut it and it's two wires, one goes in the middle and the other one goes uh, to ground and that's all it takes. And of course, the, you can tell the middle wire is the, the, is the tip and the other one is the ground. On the other side, please do not open the other side of the MIDI adapter because there's electronics inside and uh, there's nothing you should do on this side. Just Make sure it's nice, firmly closed and forget about it because it simply works. Okay, one more question here is in the last episode, no, episode 5. Okay, I'm reading a question in German. In episode 5 hast du das Zusammenspiel von Master Volume und Power Soak gezeigt. Master Volume und Power Soak. 
Ähm, kannst du vorführen und erklären, wie der Empor einzustellen ist, um Endstufensättigung bei Zimmerlautstärke 80 dB zu erzielen und war und zwar ohne Bluebox, ohne PA, sondern rein mit Gitarre, Amp One und Cabinet. Okay, Ziel ist ein britischer Rocksound. Oh man, this is long. Ähm, bei Zimmerlautstärke äh, with, äh, mit Minimal Equipment. Die Idee ist, mit Freunden Musik zu machen, zusammenzukommen, bla bla bla. Okay, um, so he wants to get a British Rock Tone and at, at Bedroom Volume. Um, First of all, I believe no power soak is needed. We can use simply the preamps in a nice setting and use the master volume on low and I'm happy. I'm happy because I do this in my living room to have a quiet thing. If you still want to use the power soak, you need to have a remote one. So he's asking if it's possible without a remote or MIDI controller I have to say no, um, but I have to say also it's not needed. I mean, m some people believe they couldn't play on master volume two because the sound was too thin. It's not too thin because the preamps in the amp one, they sound very, very thick. You just, um, you know, dial in the frequencies a bit fatter and the sound is killer on this, what I'm using myself all the time. So power soak, it to me is a special feature, but not needed, not needed for a standard situation. Okay, and he's further, the question is, uh, no, no, can, can you scroll back? Where, there, there was a second part of the question. Uh, okay, um, is this möglich, okay, einzustellen? Wird es beim MX möglich sein? Okay, will it be possible at MX? Yes, it will be possible at MX because with MX everything is possible. <laughs> um, okay, next question. John Ash. Um, ah, this is from last episode. He was asking about uh, the performance in the middle of um, the two parts of the episode. Uh, this was my three piece rock trio, um, Rock Anarchy. And I played my big pedal board. Um, which is the amp one, which is the the reflex. This one here, oops. <laughs> um, you know the tube tape delay that I designed with using Kettner, which is kind of one of my key ingredients. And all the rest was a small stone phaser. These are all components from my big pedal board, and we do have an episode that just talks about my big pedal board. So go back and find the big pedal board episode here um, on YouTube and you see exactly what I've been using because I'm using this pedal board for the last whatever four years five years exactly the same setup. So this is what I'm using all the time. Um, another question. Um, hi Thomas. Were you involved with the HK Tubemeister series? Well, yeah, this was the last things I've done for using Kettner. And here's a little thing about um, using Kettner. When, you know, they, they had a Tubemeister and they had a Grandmeister. And I wanted to start with the quality of the Grandmeister for the Tubemeister series. So they started with something that I wasn't too happy about. Um, because I had already the Grandmeister quality in my head and they said, no, no, Tubemeister is good enough. And then uh, a couple of years later, they, they brought out the Grandmeister. For me, um, the Grandmeister is, is the better amp, but I was involved in kind of both of those amps still. Um, but to be honest, I was mentally already doing my own thing with blue, for blue guitar. I didn't know exactly how it would end up, but I, I was at that time I was kind of uh, doing R and D for my own gear here. Okay, um, next question, Jens, um, welchen Echoplex clone außer dem Replex würdest du empfehlen? Okay, he is asking which. Echoplex clone 
Echoplex is the tube tape delay. Remember, we had the tape delay episode, um, and we had, um, yeah, we had, what was it? The, the black box from, what's the company? Uh, fuck, I have, a, I have a vibe from this company. It's called, it's a real deal tape machine with, with, with the wheels. Uh, they, they make all kind of boost pedals, sound, uh, US company. Look the episode <laughs> where I was talking about all the tape echoes. The big one was, was it? It was the... Um, Real tube tape delay by... Ba -ba -dum. Anyway, I will write down in the, cam uh, in the comments. Um, that's a one that's really close to the, to the original, but it's noisy. I'm not the biggest fan um, when it comes to higher gain settings, which I personally do. So, um, but that's, uh, that's a super nice real tape echo when it comes to cleaner sounds, like rockabilly sounds and stuff like that. Um, um, and then, of course, if you want to go smaller, um, we have Dunlop. They have an Echoplex pedal, like standard pedal format. And then if you combine this with like an EP3 booster, you get somewhere. You get close. It's not a real deal, but it's, um, it's something you could try. And then there's Catalin Bread, uh, a company that does some nice pedals in that direction. But to be honest, it's not the same level as the Usen Kettner one, uh, as the Replex. It's not the same like the real YouTube uh, pedals. You can get close. Maybe you find a combination with a, like a tube-like booster in combination. Get there. Yeah. And I was missing the question of the day. Which question? You can win a t-shirt. Um, what is the function that I was talking at the beginning? How to dial in the extra tones. We have the half power mode. And we have the <laughs> mode. What is the name of this functionality? <laughs> mode. Ah, okay, I should make some music just for fun. Um, and then. <laughs> I think we have the answer now. It's the low gain mode. Um, of course, we have used a few different names for that zero gain mode and the low gain mode. Well, I call it the low gain mode. Um, why? Because I can reduce the gain inside the preamp channels. And you can turn it down all the way to low as can be, and that name comes from our Dutch fellow uh, Eric de Jong. He came up with the name low, uh, no, zero gain, okay? Um, yeah, so um, low gain mode, who was the first one? 
Uh, I think on the list it's Mario Stracuzzi. Juhu! So, Mario gets another one t-shirt. I, you, know, you probably know Mario because Mario has done many great videos about the M1 and he lately also has done some of the Iridium edition M1. Um, yeah, he, he deserves and he gets a new fresh t-shirt. It's summertime, it's always good to have a fresh t-shirt. Okay, Mario will get um, his t-shirt. And we have a special guest. It's a she, and she was my first customer. She came to this place here in Germany on a day off. And this was a funny story. We knew each other from the past and she had a day off in France. I'm living right next to the French border. And the phone was ringing and her name was Jennifer Patton. She was on the phone and said, hey Thomas, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm having a day off. And I said, actually, not much. You want to go have dinner and talk? This is what we've done. We met in my living room and we had nice talks. We had something to eat. And this was when I told her about me doing my own brand, about my own amp. And she saw the amp one. <laughs> and after five minutes already, she plugged in, she played it three, four, five, six notes. That's all it was. She was blown away in the first moment and she was waving with a credit card and she wanted to get an M1 and she was begging so hard and I only had a prototype. I had to make her a wait, which I felt so sorry for her. But after two months, I could ship her my first M1 and she went on tour with the M1 all the way in South America and around the globe and she's still playing that amp. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have recorded a little interview last night here with Jennifer Batten. Enjoy our little conversation. See you after this. Cheers. Hello, this is our special guest today, Miss Jennifer Batten. And I'm so honored and well, it's great to see you again after a while. We, we know each other for a while, but we haven't seen each other for a while, right? <laughs> I think the COVID-19 is affecting a lot. Um, so, so how is the situation at your end? Oh, well, I spent the first two months sucking my thumb and then I thought maybe I should do something. <laughs> so so uh, I put together a guitar symposium we can talk about later. And yeah, that's, that, that's a cool idea. Um, I have to tell the people a little bit about our history. I mean, uh, it goes back way back for, from trade shows days and from Michael Jackson. For the, I mean, I hope everybody knows that you played maybe the biggest tours ever with Michael Jackson. I mean, have, has there ever been a bigger tour than a Michael Jackson tour you've been on? Boy, I would think not. I mean, we, we had one show in Liverpool, England that was 150,000 people. I mean, th there are shows in Brazil. I think Tina Turner had a couple hundred thousand. But as far as a, okay. <laughs> an extended tour, I mean, I think we played at Wembley Stadium five or six days in a row. <laughs> you know, 80,000 oh people yeah. there. So, yes, it was absolutely massive. Yeah, yeah I, I had once the pleasure for opening up for you guys. And that I remember 120,000 people there. I, I mean, this was the biggest crowd I've ever seen, and uh, this was in Hockenheim, Germany. Yeah. And you, the, you walked uh, from this motor drone kind of thing to the stage. Uh, we had to walk. Maybe you have been uh, driving, and Michael had his own um, what was it? Plastic covered tunnel to go yeah. on stage. This was the tour with a tank. Yeah, yeah, you know? he had to go under the stage and he would appear in what they called a toaster. There was this platform that would <laughs> pop up and just launch him really high. Uh, and that was his yeah. entrance, which seemed a bit dangerous, but he, he never fell. <laughs> Every once in a while, <laughs> the toaster wouldn't work, though, so he would just uh, kind of crawl up. <laughs> I, I think he, he crouched <laughs> down until it was stage level and then he would slowly stand up. But that's that's live. Anything can happen live. Right. 
Right, yeah, sure. But hey, what an impressive show that was. Uh, yeah. And the other thing you've done, which I'm kind of uh, a little bit jealous about, is you played with my hero Jeff Beck for many years in his band, being close to such a, uh, for me, iconic guitar player, hero. You know, when I listen to Jeff Beck, I never have a guitar in my hands. It's, it's, it's uh, a holy situation for me. It's like being at church and simply listen. I don't do that that much, but like once a year, I get my holy moment <laughs> listening to him. And uh, you, I mean, you share the stage with him a lot. So I, I guess you heard some of his noises. And of course, maybe uh, s saw a few of his secrets. Uh, can you tell us about you know his secrets uh, <laughs> or whatever you think? You know, it's, it's funny you should say that because at the time, uh, there was somebody that worked at Fender that called me up and said, okay, I got the exact specs for his guitar, and I got the Marshall DSL he was using at the time, and I'm not getting the sound. So I, I just laughed and said, <laughs> it's in his hands. The sound is in his hands. And also, the, the DSL that was released at that time, uh, the engineer, the main engineer behind it made three of them. I think one for Eric Clapton, one for Gary Moore, one for Jeff, and then he left the company. So the DSL that went out to the world was not the same beast. Like the prototypes they got. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, do you know who, who the guy was, the engineer that did, built the prototypes at Marshall? No, Steve Grinrod? No idea. I, you don't I never know. got a name. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, but, but, you know, I've I've been in the industry so long and I know the, the people behind the scenes too. So I know the guys who, who designed the 800 series of Marshall. Um, there was a Marshall prototype of uh, the, I, I think it's six, uh, um, uh, 6,100, the blue uh, 30 years anniversary. And it was straight coming from the Marshall factory to my home. So I had to criticize the amp you know, undercover. Nobody should have known right. that. And so there's, there's, there's a weird thing going on. People don't know. The reason why there is an SE100 is also me. This is because my friend at Marshall back in the days in Germany, he forced Marshall to, to buy this thing by ordering so many. You know, stuff like that. Just because I love the old Marshalls. But anyway, so I know things about prototypes. I know things b behind the scene. Uh, and um, yeah, Jeff Beck, uh, what a guy. Un unbelievable. For me, uh, you know, he is kind of the Picasso of the guitar. You know, in one note, he can say it all. You know, other people have to play, you know, Rembrandt style, 400,000 little stroke. Uh, you know, but but he's doing one, you know, elegant note, and this is all it takes. It's an incredible voice. Yeah, I, I discovered him when I yeah. was about fourteen, when the Blow by Blow record was on the radio, which was a huge record that at that time, an instrumental record was just massive. It was yeah. the biggest selling instrumental record for, I think he held the title for three decades. That was just pretty impressive. Wow. It, it bought him a, a mighty <laughs> fine house and lots of property. Yeah, he's just got such an original voice on the guitar, and there's so many aspects to what he does. I, I tell people he's, he's got the attention span of a gnat. You know, he's, he always <laughs> wants the next thing, the ne next thing, next thing. And, and because of that, he's always growing and always looking for new sounds. Yeah. And he will listen to stuff. I mean, in one day, he can go from the Spice, Girl, Spice Girls to Ornette Coleman. And he, he can <laughs> glean something out of everything. I, I've watched, um, what do they call it, UK Idol, the, like the American Idol version over there. Yeah. And, you know, he'll be yelling at the TV and just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but he'll, it might be the EQ of the snare in one song that he'll lop onto, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, some of the, the most uh, satisfying times were, we're in the bus with him listening to music and okay. just listening to his opinions, what he liked and what he didn't like. And he would pick out things that I wouldn't have heard. And, and the same in the studio, you know, you definitely don't need another guitar player on a Jeff Beck writer. 
but I was there. <laughs> and I did some playing. I did some guitar synth on the record, too. But there was times that I was in the studio for, I don't know, six or seven hours, and I'd be thinking, you know, I really don't need to be here. But then, I like every single day, like clockwork, there would be something he would say that I'd go, ah, there's the epiphany of mm. the day. Like, yeah, like yeah. one time. There's a key moment. Yeah, yeah. Like a key yeah. moment that, that you discover something new for you through him. In fact, he's got an incredible tune called Blackbird. And they mm -hmm. were, he and the producer Andy Wright were talking about uh, having some kind of conversation back with the bird and the guitar. And there was bird samples. Yeah. yeah. And he was, he finished lunch and there was a spoon next to him on the couch. And he took the spoon and just, uh, hit it on the guitar and let it bounce a few times and, and went up higher like, on the string. Yeah. Yeah. And it went... This cut. Yeah. That's what's on the ah, record. Cool, yeah. Yeah, very creative guy. In, in fact, I, this is one of my favorite stories. We, we really got into using whoopee cushions on the road after the shows. <laughs> you know, makes a <laughs> fart noise. <laughs> you blow it up and go... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One time... He takes it, fills it up, and he's got, it's like a balloon where the, the top of it is, is really yeah. tight, and you can make a squeaky sound. He played the melody to Cause We Ended As Lovers on the whoopee cushion. <laughs> yeah, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> Complete with vibrato. I mean, who would even think of doing that? <laughs> yeah. He's one of those guys yeah, that crazy guy. he doesn't play at music, he is music. Yeah, mm-hmm. So the mental side of of music, I think, is very important. This is what you learned. It's about, you know, the personality that plays chops, but it's not about chops. You know, it it is, you know, chops is just a vocabulary, but it's, you know, even a few simple words can mean so much. And this is the lesson that you can learn with him and Miles Davis and blah blah blah, some of the great players, and. Uh, of course, we do our thing, and uh, I. My first album, I called "The Beauty of Simplicity" because when I finished the album, I I realized that the stuff that I didn't play too much notes on, which was simple, was the stuff that I liked the most, ah. and uh, you know, to listen to. Of course, when I'm on stage, I I kind of enjoy playing sometimes a bit more. Then I should, but we yeah, all do. That's my fun. <laughs> yeah. What, what, okay. you, you know, one time he said what, what? one of one of the brilliant moments. He said, "You know, on a record, if the groove is great, you don't need much else." <laughs> I mean, what yeah, a zen thing true. to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally true. So cool. Yeah. So, um, talking about. Guitars. I'm I'm talking about um, setup of um, the vibrato or tremolo system on a Stratocaster. Yeah. Um, what is your preferred setup style? Are you free floating? Are you absolutely fixed? Yeah, yeah I just happen to have ah. this blue guitar. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I like to. Um, I use the snot out of the tremolo bar, and I, I think it. The right. name should be changed to the expression bar because it allows you yeah. to, you know, swell in and out of notes like a singer can can do. Yeah. And uh, it's a, a different vibrato than you get with your finger. So it's just another color to have in your bag of tricks. But I absolutely love the floating bar. Ever since uh, mm -hmm. I... I used to read all the interviews that came out with Van Halen in the 80s, and there was always, you know, a great nugget of information in those as well. <clears throat> and that's the first time I, I heard about the Floyd Rose. And, you yeah. know, I had I had problems with the, the tremolo on my Strat, and so I switched over to that. But, um, you know, Jeff's, what he can do with the Fender Trem is is unbelievable. He's He's got a wonderful ear anyway, but... He he'll do entire melodies on that, like because we end. Uh, uh, where were you? That melody where he. Where were you? I'm here. Uh, yeah. He takes a harmonic yeah. and just does a whole melody. Yeah. Okay. I have no uh, connect. But this is 
I was so deeply impressed when I heard this the first time. I, you know, goosebumps, unbelievable, you know. Absolutely. Do, 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 and the high notes, you know, and he gets them almost every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, un unbelievable. So what I like about his way is that he uses, um, you know, to, to have the pitch going up and down, not only dive bombs, like the typical cliche from the 80s, uh, but, you know, he, you know, having whole notes, half notes. And I found that, that I have to set up the, in the way that I have to, the, the, the G string can bend up um, a minor third. And then on the B string, is, it's, it's a whole note. And the, the high E string is only half step. Yeah. Um, but then there's some like, you can have intervals. Ah. By, by doing that. Nice. Yeah. So that's, uh, if you think about that, you can come up with stuff. This is like the country players doing, I don't know what's the English, with double bends, right. you know, bending two strings at the same time. And, and, and that, that works here with a setup job as well a bit. I'm not sure, maybe Jeff does, does that thing too, or I know of Carl Verheyen, he's doing that. Ah. And, uh. But, but the funny thing is, I've done this even before I knew about Carl. Okay. <laughs> There's some natural things you can discover, which oh, sure. become, um, yeah, which is good to find out that you are not alone doing stuff like that. Uh, yes, yes. It's good to have company in that. I, I, I like to go up, uh, or to be able to go up a minor third for sure. Any higher than that, I get scared mm -hmm. I'm going to break a string. It's, it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It's you know, dangerous. you're just on I, yeah. edge where you just want to go there, but nah, maybe not. <laughs> Especially yeah. if you don't have a spare guitar but on you, stage. Yeah, and but you are also the master of the Digitech uh, kind of whammy program that you have in your whatever RP1000. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, you, you go up and down. Is it only down or up? The, the, or the mode that I use almost all of the time goes down a whole step with my foot. So you, you can take uh, a whole chord, yeah. even if you have a floating bridge, you can take a whole chord down a whole step and kind of emulate a slide uh, mm -hmm. without having to go look for the piece of glass and breaking it on stage and all that. <laughs> so I, I use that a lot, but I, it, it's funny, uh, this course we'll talk about later, I'm, I'm doing a, a module on mm. uh, the tremolo bar and the whammy pedal, because I use them both for different things. And in, integrate in them both. Yeah. I mean, I can do a lot of the same stuff with each one, but I kind of break it out into different reasons. Well, for, for one thing, you can take the whole guitar down in a D tuning. So even if, you, if you're playing a whole yeah. song that's in D or even a section of a song, I, I will drop it down to D so I can make use of those open strings. And you can also yeah. get harmonics, like natural harmonics, quote unquote, that you could never get on guitar yeah. because you've dropped the whole thing down a whole step. So you can get just about every melody note out there. So I, I've started, I mean, mm. I've done it for a while, but especially recently, I've started working on melodies that are entire melodies in harmonics. And like when I need a C, a C natural, <laughs> which I don't even know, I don't know where to get it as a natural. How to get it? I, no, it's it's not here. But if you have a, a D drop yep. down, and then there's your C. I get you. Yeah, but the way you use that, I think it's so natural. It's like now you you're mastering this this, ah, this kind well, of thing. You. I haven't seen anybody else besides you doing that in the in this kind of natural way and perfection, you know. And the other thing I was really impressed about when we played was your swell tones. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know when you had your Compressor, yeah, such a unique <laughs> sound, you know. I like how you say it, because <laughs> that's what it does. <laughs> it's like an automatic yeah. volume pedal. It's a uh, well, I guess the original one was a Boss slow gear that you play the note yeah. and the volume would gradually come up. But yeah, that's that's one of my favorite Digitech sounds ever, and that um, that sound is behind my song in the aftermath. I, I just started messing uh, with, okay. uh, well, what do you call it? We used to call it the Jan Hammer scale. It'd be one, three, four, five, flat seven. It just has a very exotic sound. Okay, 
Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, that, that was the yeah. basis for the melody that I did with that sound. And it just, you know, when you're inspired by a sound, mm -hmm. it can take you in all kinds of places. Like uh, uh, one of the sounds, I don't use it that much, but if you set the whammy pedal to go up an octave with your foot, I was messing with that one day mm -hmm. with a power chord and really digging in with my right hand to get harmonics coming out. And then I lifted the whole thing up an octave and it sounded like a cat fight outside of your window in the summer, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that begot a, a tune on, I think it's on my first record, Above, Below, and Beyond, called Cat Fight. That mm -hmm. that still is yeah. is a song that people resonate with. It's only two minutes long, but it's just wacky. <laughs> yeah, but uh, super special. I yeah, I, I heard this cat scream. So <laughs> super. Um, if when you use the the, the RP one thousand and you you also use the HX stomp lately? Yeah. You told when me? I read about the HX stomp, then, I go, man, 2.7 pounds. It's all about the ounces when you travel. I go, I, I am going to learn to love this thing no matter what because of the weight of it. And I, so I have your yeah. amp. I'm using the amp one and using the four cable method with the HX stomp. And I'm using a soft step MIDI switcher, which is only one pound. So it's just so much lighter than what I had been carrying around. Plus it's MIDI, so it enables me to change the amp channel and my uh, mm -hmm. preset at the mm -hmm. same time. At the same time, yeah. So only one footstep does it all. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, so you are doing this course. What, what, what is the thing? I mean, of course we know uh, there's Corona, the COVID-19 uh, situation. Yeah. We we don't have many gigs. Uh, I, I only had a few. I'm lucky. Uh, this Saturday, I, I have a, a, a gig in front of parking cars. The, what is it? A movie? Right, right. Uh, Drive-in drive drive theater. Drive-in drive theater. Th theater. Yeah. Uh, I've done another one of the, these, but uh, it's better than nothing, to be honest. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> but it's not the real deal. <laughs> I, I did my first gig last Saturday, first gig since mid-February, and it was like an exorcism. Just being able to yeah. play <laughs> and connect with people. Yeah. There was In my city, there's 25 people max that can gather, and they oh, were into it. They stayed much, for yeah. the whole two yeah. sets. And it just felt so mm -hmm. good. I, I, I guess it's a, the tendency to get lazy when you don't have a gig, you know, and all of a sudden it's a panic like, oh, God, are my chaps up to par? And it's like, oh, these things got a little soft during the lockdown. And I, I have one more gig, which I'm really thankful for. So, yeah, it's, it's rough times. So anyway, um, I started thinking. But you use the time now for, 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 for this thing you are preparing. So yeah. can you tell me a bit more about the guitar symposium or what it is? Yeah, it's guitar, we meet in the cloud, <laughs> symposium, guitarcloudsymposium.com. Symposium. And I've, I've gathered ah. uh, three other women that I've toured with that are monster players, uh, Neely Brosh. It, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't designed to like, this is a women's festival. It's just people I knew and respected. Neely Brosh uh, has played with Tony McAlpine. She's just a monster player. Uh, went through Berkeley, and she's got several solo records out. Um, and she also played with Cirque du Soleil. Uh, Gretchen Men has played with a, a Led Zeppelin tribute band for years, touring America, probably Europe too, called Zepparella. Yeah. She's yeah. got records out. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. And Vicky Genfin is an acoustic guitar player that has a very original tapping style, a rhythmic style. As you have your own tapping style, well, you know, you are mistapping. Yeah. Besides all the crazy sounds, we yeah, yeah, and wee wee, and pee pee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we were all meeting yeah. on, on Zoom once a week to, to hash okay. out what this would be. And I, I designed it like TED Talks, where we would do modules that are 20 minutes long, because people have short attention spans, and, you know, you don't want to go for two hours on one subject. So it's kind of like a smorgasbord of all the things that we are most passionate about. Each of us will be do, doing six modules, um, 20 minutes, 20, 20, and then it's followed by a Q&A period and a, a little break before the next person comes along. And I'm, I'm starting mm -hmm. the whole thing. Well, it's a four-day event. 
on the Friday night, August 7th, we're going to gather for a, mm-hmm. a couple hours on Zoom and do an orientation, Q&A kind of thing, hang. Then Saturday and Sunday, we're going to hit it, 9 a.m. Pacific time, mm-hmm. you know, hour after hour, mm-hmm. seven hours uh, a day. And at the end of the day, there, there'll be another Q&A. And then the Monday night will be a Q&A cocktail party celebration kind of thing. And I, I'm mm-hmm. starting off the whole thing with um, a module on brain science and the optimal ways to learn, uh, which is really important because after learning learning how people learn, it's changed the way that I learn. So I thought that would be a good foundational right. thing to set off. And it's funny, all four of us, I said, you know, write out your wish list of what you want to teach. And all four of us came back with tapping. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> really? uh, we, we all have a different approach. And Gretchen decided to let us have at it. Uh, Neely Brosh and I both have different approaches to it. And Vicky has a definite different one for for a acoustic guitar, and I, I also have a a module on the tremolo bar, on and and, mm-hmm. and whammy pedal and getting really expressive with that, mm. and also I'm really into intervallic playing, playing with wider skips mm. than the normal seconds and thirds, uh, so that's a another passion of mine. Uh, Neely is doing one on. Uh, adding chromaticism to your playing, which is something I'm really interested in. I, I want to see everybody's modules because I'm excited about sure. learning that <laughs> as well. Because everybody has something different to, to bring. Another one on how to build a solo to a peak, which is really important. And mm-hmm. So many people are just like, okay, here's a solo. <laughs> you know, it's just, it doesn't go <laughs> yeah. anywhere. It's just... No climax. Yeah. yeah no, no story. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And Very important. She's also doing another one on performance psychology, which is hugely important because so many people have stage fright and don't know how to deal with the anxiety of presenting their music for people. So I, I think that's going to be a huge topic that goes into the Q&As. And uh, in fact, I, uh, I did a, a similar kind of seminar years ago, and I, d- I recorded a, a meditation kind of visualization for people. Because mm-hmm. it's just like sports people that visualize that they're shooting baskets without having the basket anywhere or the ball anywhere near them. Baseball players, you know, knocking it out of the park, visualizing it. And it's been proven by science that it works. So I, 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 I totally agree. I, I think this mental side and, you know, the side of not having the instrument in your hand and just having your brain work the right way is so important. I'm self-taught, so I don't know the things, but I do stuff like this, riding on my push bike, and my brain is doing all this stuff. I composed all my best melodies on the push bike and then singing it to my whatever, uh, dictaphone back in the days and now to my mobile phone. Yeah. And uh, But it's the brain, it's the whole thing, even... You know, I can do the arrangements in my head, and I don't need an instrument. Instrument, and um, and also I can mentally prepare for a show. You know, I've played stuff with orchestras, and I'm not a reader. You know, I, I'm a lousy, lousy, lousiest reader. You know, <laughs> if I if they if they show me dots, I have to pee. You know, see you in 15 minutes. I go to the toilet and try to <laughs> to see what this could be. Okay, <laughs> just to get a, a little bit of something. Is uh, okay. I'm not so good. My ears work better than my reading, but then mental pressure, you know, would kill anything I could give. Sure. And to deal with this and kind of find a way how to p- position yourself and make your brain more open again and connect to the stuff that you know and blah, blah, blah. Hey, this saved my ass a lot, many times. And um, I, I think it's super um, good to, to learn about this side as well because you can get chops everywhere. You you go on wherever YouTube and somebody shows you the wrong version of Eddie Van Halen solo, of course. <laughs> but at least take it as an imp- uh, uh, ins- inspiration. But um, some people throw the right version too, which is okay. I'm joking. But um, the thing is, um, if you can connect this, 
you know, hardware facts of the playing with the software skills in your, in your brain. This is where you get really to the next level. Yeah. And this is where people can learn from you pros, you know, because you've been there. I, I know how it feels to stand in front of 120,000 people and you know how it feels because you've done it 100 times more than I did. And it is, it, I mean, once you've done it, 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 it's an experience. But the first time you do it, it's like you have to survive, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like uh, Robert Fripp says, playing live shows is like being in the battle zone. That that's just how he yeah. says it. There's there's yeah. so many elements to get through. It's never yeah. ever ever gonna sound like it sounds in your studio <clears throat> with great monitors. You just have to yeah. learn to to go with it. But yeah, yeah, and and you have you have to take things as they are. I mean, you know, even even if you have technicians and the most expensive production, like with Michael Jackson, blah blah blah. Sometimes things go wrong, and you, and the show must go on. So as a pro, pro, mentally you should be, you know, you have to know how to deal with these extreme situations. You know, not not everything works out planned as planned. Mm -hmm. You know. And I'm I'm not uh, I'm sure you have um, experienced many different uh, crazy situations, and of course you've been there. You dealt with them in a certain way, and um, I I think being a professional musician is also you stay cool with stuff that is not normal. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, funny you should bring that up because. One of the modules that will be taught is by Gretchen Mann, and she's a commercial pilot, yeah. or was a commercial pilot. And, you know, I wanted to, Ooh. when I was building the, the PR for this Guitar Cloud Symposium, um, I thought the fact that she was a pilot was just cool. You know, it's, it's just a, a different kind of <laughs> yeah. thing. And at first she goes, ah, that doesn't have to do with music. Don't even put that in there. And then she started thinking about it, and now she has a module about how being a pilot prepared her for certain things in music because you yeah. have to be prepared for disasters like that. You know, like, yeah. okay, there's a cable that's buzzing. What, you know, how to source it out and figure out how to fix it immediately. So th that's a, it, it's a really interesting angle. And Vicki Genfin is, uh, has a very holistic approach to guitar. And one of the things that she's doing is called R Rut Buster. And, and that is... You know, she's into open tunings. So you take open mm -hmm. tunings, all of a sudden your scales don't work, your chords don't work, and you're forced to <laughs> create only from your ear and shapes. And so yeah, her right. thing is like, pick up the guitar, play something you have never played before. Great. That's yeah. not easy. You know, you really have to think yeah. about that. And God only knows what you'll create. It might become a, a whole new thing for you. Mm. And the, the other thing I learned also, I mean, we, we learn about the guitar, uh, but on the other hand, when you learn that, you can even transpose this back to your regular life. Everything I learned on a certain topic in the amp designs or on playing the guitar or being on tour, I could use in my standard life, in my ordinary life as well. You know, everything is connected. It is, yeah. So it's it, it, and the good thing about music, you go to places, mental places where you, you usually would never go. You are you are getting out of your comfort zone. You know, this is why you try to improvise and come up with new stuff and learn something new. In your in your regular life, sometimes you you repeat yourself too many times, Perhaps, yeah. too many times. So, and that's a beauty about playing a musical instrument, it opens you up in a mental way as well. So ah, it's just great. Yeah, it's, it's almost like me. creativity is a muscle. That it, yeah. When I first, I first moved uh, from LA to Portland 16 years ago, and I made enough money selling my house, I took almost a year off. And I, I started taking stained glass classes, and that led to fused glass. And, you know, I, I just love the balance of visual arts and music. And that's that's when I would listen to music the most is when I'm working on visual arts. You know, and it, it, mm -hmm. one thing feeds the other. It's <laughs> yeah. 
It's yeah, it's all connected in any in any uh, genre you kind of grow you it 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 kind of gets to the others as well to make make you as a human being complete. And then if you are a, a more complete person, you play better. Sure. It's all, you know. And you, look look at, at guys like uh, Billy Gibbons, for instance. I mean, he doesn't play the, the hottest chops and he doesn't play the tapping that you know and the weirdest whatever bendings, but he is mentally totally aware of what he's doing and he's cool about it, mm. you know? So this is, this is uh, you know, and so it all, it's all connected, you know? And um, if, if you have the chance to, to, to uh, share the knowledge with, you know, people like you, Gretchen and uh, you know pro players, um, it's worth it's worth doing that because now is the time. Next year, when the COVID is over, everybody has to be on tour again. Right. So now is the now is the year, you know, to be on the guitar cloud symposium, right? Yeah, yeah. And we we do want to do more of these in the future. Um, you know, I think yeah. as long as we're locked down, it'll be the same people, but. Who knows? I mean, you might, if if you could condense something into 20 minutes, <laughs> then you're welcome to join us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a hard challenge it's, it's for me easy. because, you know, my live, my live streams go off for two hours. <laughs> and my, But, uh, okay, um, I'm working on this. Okay, <laughs> and we come back to this subject next year. But, hey, um, thanks for joining in today. And uh, for those who are interested, say it again. It was uh, the Guitar Cloud... Symposium. Symposium.com, yes. correct? Yep. That's where you, okay. you, can, you can hear audio samples of all of us. There's a video there. You can um, read our bios and read exactly what subjects we're teaching and download the schedule and buy a ticket. Yeah, okay, of course. <laughs> okay, hey, Jennifer, thanks so much for joining in. And um, we'll meet soon, somehow, somewhere. Cool. Hopefully in the US when it's still alive. <laughs> Some festival somewhere around the world, who knows? Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, cheers. Okay. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, if you want to hear more about Jennifer and myself, um, we have a video here on YouTube from a clinic that we've done in um, Stuttgart, Germany. Um, and we actually played some Jeff Beck tunes. Um, uh, yeah, check that out. Uh, Brushing with the blues or something like that. And she shows off with all the nice uh, bendings. Um, it's great. I hope the beginning of this episode was not too nerdy, but I wanted to show you that the M1 has more than just what you see at first glance. You know, there's four channels, but each of the channels can be tweaked. And you can download this from our website. We have links below in the description of this stream where you can find the information how you tune your M1. I know it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's a special expert feature that might make you happy if you want more than what you get out of the box. The next episode, we are dealing with something that is kind of another very important topic. It's recording. We are using, we will using real microphones. We will use some cap simulators with IRs. We will also compare them again versus our blue box. We will also check the sound quality of the direct outs from the M1. And we will visit our good friend Alex Bayroth, you remember from last episode, three ago, uh, in his own studio where he shows us his production that he's just about to finish, where he used the M1 Iridium Edition. So this episode was more about me being the nerdy guy on the clean sounds and some mellow overdrive tones. Uh, next episode will be more in your face. And of course, you get some insights into recording techni techniques. Okie dokes, I hope you enjoyed this one. See you soon next week. All the best. Stay safe. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>